birds get more bold um the higher the income level of a neighborhood i used to live in a, when i was younger a very not very but it was like more middle class the ducks there so entitled so aggressive they want food here in my lower income neighborhood uh no they're scared <laughs> they, they, you can't go up and feed them they're like we don't want to be dinner that's such a weird aside will <laughs> Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It's me, your host, Maria, with a new background because I had to move shit around my house. Uh, and with me today is my ruggedly handsome co-host, William. Here's me. I have new shelves. That's Ooh. about how much I could contribute to the new <laughs> change in uh, visuals. But, you know, I'm going to at some point, I'm going to turn this white bookshelves with color coordinated books and twinkly lights. And then we'll hit the big time. I've been telling Maria forever. That is the recipe for success for a booktuber. I also, we have to not review things as in-depthly and just talk about all the books we bought because capitalism. That would be a shame. I have a friend of mine who watches our videos and he's like, I read your comments and everybody loves the analysis. You guys should do more analysis. You should do more rewrites of books. People love those. And I'm like, thank you for reading our comments and your feedback. <laughs> you guys, my mom does the same thing and she'll tell me when there's a new comment and read it to me. And I'm like, you're faster than me and Maria on these sometimes. That is so cute. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see then. Let's go and get started. So what book are we doing today? Oh, well, we are doing Nettle and Bone. And of course, we don't know the author's name, guys. We never know. Wait, just wait, wait, wait. I'm just I'm just going to pull it up because, uh, you know, I, I liked I liked this book. So I think we should talk about the author and give her some or uh, a little bit of interest. Yeah, um, this is one of our book club books. So T our patrons are here. Kingfisher. T. Kingfisher. Very Thanks, cool. Thanks, Magical name. Girl Shawn. Um this was one of our uh, Patreon uh, book clubs uh, books, which our patrons chose. Um, by the way, join our Patreon. It's a good time. As it's I've been telling people, time. you get access to a Discord with lots of cool, sexy people. And then for a, a little bit more, you get to be part of our book club and make us read usually bad books, but in this case, good books. And if you want personal feedback on 5,000 words that you wrote, William over here mm -hmm. will review and give you feedback on your writing yeah. uh I, I just as incisive but more polite than you yes. see in these videos he's, he's very polite <laughs> uh, i promise guys um i don't maybe i will one day but i currently don't so um, i don't know because now that you're single you have more time i do have more time now that i'm single <laughs> unfortunately i'm using that on house projects well, yeah, no, it looks good. Okay, we should get started for people who are not our fans who are watching this video and don't yes. want to hear about our banter. Um, Natalie Bone, I really liked it. Uh, there's two halves to this book, and I liked the first half more than the second half, but it was really nice to read a good book for our book club, and I think um, from what I saw on our Discord, everyone really liked it. So uh, what were your impressions? So I really enjoyed this book. I found it a super easy read. It went by really quick. It's not super long, but I think it is telling a concise story. There are some pieces of the narrative that I think work from a world building set scene setting stage in the beginning, but that I was expecting because of how prominent it was in the beginning to be way more significant to the plot of the whole book. And it wasn't. And I think it could have been cut and we could have done something else in that start. Um, I also really enjoyed the second half uh, or the first half. I did enjoy the second half, but there's a slow Novik-esque-ness to the mm -hmm. first half that I really vibe with. And I also like how this author um, chose to start in action and then flashback to the events leading up where I think if she had done it the opposite way was just doing things chronologically, it wouldn't have worked. This main character, I also like some people have noted that uh, this main character, her name's Mara is a bit passive and there are points where they wish she was doing more, but I don't know why. I think I just, this is me as I get older. I really liked her. I really liked it because it felt realistic that there's this character who like, she's got these things she can do. And when then those things are applicable, she's doing it, baby. But when it's not, she's like sitting in the sidelines like, oh my God, I hope these other people don't die. <laughs> okay. So one thing about Mara is that she has a lot of anxiety. 
And I found it super stressful to read because that is how I am like in everyday life. Like at one point she talks about like she might have to sell her body for money. And she's like, how would you even do that? Like, who do you go talk to? And I was like, oh, my God, that is the most relatable thing in the world. Like that is the thing that would bother me. Yeah, that is Maria's cat data. Um, and so like as somebody with that kind of anxiety in real life, it was just very stressful to read. And I did find her more passive in the second half, like yes. in the climax. I'm not sure she actually even does anything. Um, the part of it is there's a there's a shift again in genre where in the first half it feels more lyrical and like realistic almost to a certain extent. <laughs> Guys, Maria's cat is still on screen. Um, I'm not switching away from this. Um, and um, and so she's a little bit more active, but also her passivity feels um, a little bit less noticeable, I think, where in the second half, everybody's like wise cracking deconstruction of tropes like a, a touch. And so it's like you kind of want a more active character for that. Yep. I I don't know. I really like the passive character. I know some people I think Chelsea was saying uh, that she hated that, that she was a bit more of a passive character. Um, and then uh, Valerie said, I love she was kind of the child who was always standing in the wrong place uh, or whatever. Such a vibe. Um, and it, I just, I don't know. I really liked the passive, like, and it's just because I, I have a book percolating in my head. Um, and my main character is very passive. She's very much more of an observer, much more of an Anne Elliot, if you will, um, as a character goes, which is a character type I super vibe with. Uh, and I, I just, it's, it was refreshing. I see a lot of, I, and I suppose because we've just read a lot where it's this like super active, like super impacting the story. And sometimes like, at least she wasn't sassy. That's all I'm saying. She wasn't sassy. So I, Mara's passivity, hesitancy, she just felt really real <laughs> for me. Like just like I, I, and not that I'm an anxious person. I'm not. Uh, I'm much more of like an Agnes slash dust wife combo. <laughs> yeah, um, Maria is is the the neurotypical one among our friend group. Um, <laughs> very much so. She has like good instincts all the time and is very steady. All right, some comments. Um, Jenny said, "I don't. I didn't mind Mars' pass passiveness. I think it's passivity. Passiveness. Passive. Yeah, it should be passivity, passivity. Though, I think." Eh, eh, eh. Don't unsubscribe because of that. Um, I just didn't like she subconsciously refused to acknowledge her competency. That gets annoying. It's a real thing yeah. people do, but it does get annoying to read. That I will agree with. Um, Chelsea says the always just out of a state, just to step out of place vibe was perfect. Yes, she as a person was a great character. I just wish she'd done more for herself. Yeah, again, it's it's again having a lot of her same anxieties and stuff. It's like it's realistic but it's kind of annoying to read it's also annoying to live through by the way um let's see uh valerie says i'm with marie on this i adore tomorrow's head i don't know hesitancy. what is with me reading today guys i'm a little it's bit fine. sick i got you uh celia well, celia says i liked her as a character but i don't know if she works within a book if it works within a, a book and i suppose she's the kind of character where if she was a side character i think more people would vibe with her um Miss Ally Snow says uh, she's not a conventional protagonist, which worked for me, but I wouldn't have enjoyed her as much in a full length book. And this was something I saw in the yeah. uh, Patreon, like in, not on our Patreon, in our Discord discussion about this. Um, and then uh, Celia said, maybe if there was another way that she was driving the plot forward. Um, and uh, I, f I feel that for me, the fact that she put the plan together and then just like it went, I, I was like, Nobody would be here if it wasn't for Mara, which is, which is partially me, me liking something and making excuses, but I completely understand why it wouldn't work for me. I loved it. I wouldn't change it, but it's like, the, it's like when uh, we read um, uh, Nona and Will and I were like, eh, it could have been shorter. And Katie was like, it was perfect in every way. Like <laughs> that's where I am. Like I really enjoyed her as a character and it just vibed with me for some reason, but I can acknowledge why like passive characters are not generally super enjoyable. They're and I think very she, hard to read. Yeah. I think she's a foot over the line for most people. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I don't think she's super over the line. You, you yeah. I think know. the problem I had, and I think what may have wrong footed people is the impression I got of her character in the first half 
was not the character we got in the second half. Like a lot of her anxiety issues, I felt like kind of crept up in the second half more than the first half. It like did. when she started having them more, I'm like, I don't quite know if the like the it, it makes sense that the author would feel that she was writing her that way the whole time, but I was a little wrong footed by it. It's really interesting because there was a moment when she was building the bone dog uh, in the start and like going to the Forsaken Lands, that's the Cursed Lands, what, I don't know, whatever they are, the place with the cannibals, um, where I thought the Mara we were getting in the flashbacks was really like, <sighs> like I, I thought a lot of time had passed between her being like, I'm going to go do this thing and then her getting to this point and she had developed a little bit past that. And so it was really strange to me that she hadn't. And then her in the flashbacks and her in the second half of the book, I felt were way more connected than her in that first third when she was doing the tasks for the dust wife. Mara doing the tasks yeah. for the dust wife was very active and felt a little unsure of herself, but much more competent. Mm -hmm. um, my fix for that, for me, is not the fix anybody else would make, but I would have made her a little bit more anxiety ridden and path, like uh, unsure of herself in that first third to connect the whole thing. I think everybody else would have had a really like passive growing up, get competent and then stay competent, which <laughs> conventional standards, I understand. <laughs> but um, so Ceridian said, uh, that's a third of a meter over the line for international audiences. Excellent. Uh, such a good joke. Thank you. Um, and then Lindbergh said, um, uh, Lindbergh said that it felt halfway between a middle age. Oh, Valerie said that Lindbergh said that it felt halfway between a middle grade fairy tale and an adult high fantasy. And I agree. It walks a delicate line and teeters on the edge of something a little strange that risks pe knocking people out of the story by its strangeness. But I think for the most part, it's successful and hauntingly beautiful. I think a lot of the book toes a delicate line in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about that a little in the second half too. How it like, um, so the male character whose name I'm already oh Fenris, like most of the world is like generic fantasy, which is fine, and then all of a sudden he comes from a very specific Norse culture, and I felt like that was kind of a weird touch. How like the book doesn't quite handle you read that it as Norse. Yeah, his name's Fenris. I mean, fair enough, but I did not get it. I, I, at least I didn't read Norse. Out he of talks it. about the all father, not the all father, the fathers a lot and stuff like that. Miss um, yeah, Alex Snow said in that first third, she kind of had to be more active because she didn't have most of her crew yet. That's actually a good point is that, yeah, the crew has to do stuff in the last half. So, like, she actually can't do as much. Yeah. I'll also say that the things she's doing in the first, that first third where she is more active are things she can do. You know what she can do? Bitch can work with her hands. She can weave. She can make a cloak. She can take wire and attach it to bones. Those are all things within my bitch's wheelhouse. I love me a crafty bitch. <laughs> do you know how nice it was to see a character who was basically like a crafty ass gremlin? Go on an adventure. <laughs> I loved it. That's why I love Mara. Because she's a crafty ass little gremlin. Yeah, I thought you were going to like this. But we haven't really talked about it beforehand. Because I finished it late. Because I was sick all last week. But yeah, I kind of felt like you were going to like it. Um, Chelsea says, I actually think I agree with you, Maria. I think we'd spent... I think if we'd spent more time with her on the tasks. Figuring out how to do them and being unsure. I would have felt like she was doing something there. Yeah, that's a good point. And it would have connected her better to how she is in the rest of the book. She feels way too sure of herself for like a, a 40, 50 page period. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this bitch got anxiety. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, like a lot of it. And I was like, okay, that was a weird connection between the two. In general, that opening of her in the Sundered Land or whatever it's called, like the liminal place, did not really, I, I felt like set you up for a different kind of book. There's this whole thing about how in books, like in your first paragraph or two, you need to set up to the reader what genre you're in. And like, I felt like this was going to be different than it ended up. And especially that first half is very different from the second half. So I think it's just a little bit odd. I think if you like both kind, what are you doing? I thought this was going to be fairy tale zombie book. I thought it was going to be zombies and it was going to be fairy tales, but it was going to be mainly zombie cannibals. That was it gonna was that not was, zombie cannibals. That would have been very cool, actually. But um, yeah, no, because like all the, there's zombie cannibals, and like you're like, and then later in the book, it's like actually we're gonna go back to normal things. Um, so uh, it's so dark in the first, like like 
there's this idea that there's this darkness uh, that people are being punished. Like you're starving, you end up eating something you shouldn't, maybe a human flesh. Uh, and then it turns you into these less Ghouls. intelligent humanoid like, like, uh -huh. like you're still you still look like a human but like there's you meet a character who has begun eating flesh but isn't far down the process and the way he speaks he struggles to articulate what he wants to say and it's a, a huge thing and i was like i thought that was going to be the heart and the idea that this dark land was moving closer and yeah. closer to her homeland that and nope. this is what what I said earlier when I said there's something in the beginning that sets up a particular vibe slash thing and then never goes anywhere. This is it. I, the blistered lands. Thank you, Ice Willow. Coming in clutch. Uh, our patrons are just the goddamn best, guys. Join. Then you can be the goddamn best. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that should be one of our patron tiers. The goddamn best. The goddamn best. That's um, what we're going to make the normal one now. Yeah, you, we should. We should make the normal patrons the goddamn best. Um, um, you know what, though? Specifically, one of the things that sets up her character in a way that doesn't... She, okay, so she's having a discussion with these two cannibals at the beginning, right? And she she's, like, very jaded about humanity in that moment. She talks about how they were nice to her in the way that other people weren't. And how she's, like, very... She, she accepts them as they are. And I was like, oh, okay, this bitch has been through a lot. She is like now on the outside of society, That's you know, exactly and then it's like, it really is like, there's a weird disconnect between the character post in, in the first half versus the second half. We should probably start getting into the plot a little bit. So you guys understand what we're talking about. Yeah. And it's um, really only the first third. Once, once she leaves the, once she has bone dog, like it just, it, the vibe of it completely shifts. It becomes like political, uh, fairy tale retelling. Also, someone mentioned hold that on. this is the. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, okay, uh, two. All right, hold on, hold on. Uh, Celia said, I "Never thought I would say I would want more cannibalism, but here we are, 2023, <laughs> starting out strong." Angry Otter says, "Yeah, I thought the blistered panda was going to be like a malevolent force against like the forest and uprooted." Uh, that's obviously autocorrect, but I like blistered panda <laughs> as an antagonistic force. Um, and uh, then Jenny says, "I feel like they didn't utilize the Dustwife to the best of her capabilities. She really didn't do anything that didn't seem like Mara or Agnes could do until the very end." Um, yeah, there's the dead boy in the river. I, I kind of, I, I, I agree. I think Agnes got the best treatment as one of the side characters agnes is my favorite character i, I didn't is, like her quite as much at the end as in the beginning but she's a great character which is hysterical because she's exactly the kind of character i would never expect you to love but she is the best she has she's introduced with low social like low self-esteem and i'm like oh she's great but she's also evil and powerful and i it's, really love she was it's really so, cute. she's she's like l if l had actually turned out like her mom personality wise yeah that's actually really true i thought of l too yeah, yeah. uh so yeah let, let let's get into it guys. okay here we go full screen um so this book <laughs> opens with our main character her name is mara she on a quest we don't exactly know what it is except that she's doing some tasks that this lady named the dust wife told her she had to do so that she would help her kill a prince and you're like "Ooh, why are we killing this prince uh and we open up uh near the blistered lands or in the blistered lands and this bitch is building a dog out of fucking bones okay and you're like that's weird uh and you also get this backstory, which I've kind of already mentioned, which is that the blistered lands are these terrible places where the gods are punish punishing humans um, for like being starved. Like the, the humans are starving in the blistered lands because nothing really grows. And then they turn to eating unconventional things. And then the unconventional things that they're eating, probably humans, it's cannibalism, guys, turns them into uh, kind of less intelligent flesh craving monsters. Uh, and again, you start this and you're like, ooh, cannibal, fairy tale land, great time. So anyway, she's in this blistered land. She's building this bone dog. You get flashbacks to the dust wife giving her other tasks, such as making a uh, coat out of uh, uh, owl. I, no, it was owl something. Uh, owl, okay, this owl is another bread. reason that like the first half is way darker than the second half. Like it's so dark, and I was like, oh shit, because she remembers at one point like her hands are like bloody, and she's like, I gotta keep going, and she's pushing yep. them in, and, and like it's, it's like painful, and I was like, oh my god, it was god. rough. 
So let me, this isn't how the book tells you, but I'm going to give you her backstory. Our girl Mara, she a heckin' princess. How'd she end up in the blistered lands, you ask? Let me tell you. Um, her, her kingdom that she is princess of is a tiny little city-state. It is a harbor city, and it's a deep water harbor, and the southern kingdom wants that harbor. The northern kingdom fucking wants that harbor. And so her mother makes the decision to marry hold her older sister, Damia, who she has the best relationship with. She has a um, her second oldest sister, the middle child, Kanya. She doesn't have a great relationship. As young kids, Kanya often was like, I hate you. You's annoying. And she, like, tucked that. There's this great thing about her tucking things up under her ribs, which is just such a fantastic, like, it's not in her heart, but she's tucked it up under there. And I love that as an owl cloth. That's what it was. Thank you, Valerie. Um, that's such a nice description. Um, and uh, they marry Damia off to Prince Vorleg, who is the Prince of the Northern Kingdom. About six months, at, and like, this Mara is like a little sensitive, not the brightest bulb, princess bub and so when damia gets married she cries don't leave and damia's like i have to this is our job we heckin princesses gotta do what we gotta do so she gets married off six months later bitch is dead okay damia's dead she comes back <laughs> on a box and i do love the way you describe things sometimes <laughs> <laughs> bitch is dead <laughs> <laughs> she did and mara's like i told you so like she somehow she's super upset but she somehow vindicated because she thought something bad was gonna happen and then her mom's like well we're gonna have to marry kanya off to prince four like again and and everybody the this story of how damia died which is she fell she 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 had a heck and fall tragic accident and uh mara's like i don't buy it i got ick. i got the i got icky vibes um and kanya's like no this is what i have to do stop being a fucking baby so kanya goes off and gets married um a year goes by kanya's not getting pregnant there are some struggles happening so prince vorleg is like you need to send your youngest daughter to a fucking convent because my children need to be the heirs to my kingdom and your fucking little city state kingdom so i need to make sure this bitch mara ain't having sex send her to a convent. And Mara's mom is like, I have to send you to a convent. And at first Mara's really upset about it. And her mom's like, nah, I kind of think you're going to like the convent better. Mara does like the convent better. Super easy life. She gets into weaving. She like, uh, Okay, gardens. so there's another part here that made me think she was a different character than she was going to be, which is that originally because she's a princess's like, I was gonna say princess's daughter, a princess, she, um, they don't have her clean the stables. And when she learns about it, she's like, no, I'm going to clean the stables. And she goes and she does it, yeah. even though like it blisters her hands. And the thing about it is that this sets you up a bit like uh, to think she's kind of a willful child who doesn't necessarily listen to authority, but also more of that like strong girl archetype than you usually find in these kind of books. And so it doesn't really make sense with her anxiety later. Again, it's like, it, it's not totally incongruous, but it, signals to it signaled to me a different kind of character than the one we got later for me what it did because by this point in the retelling i kind of got that mara was the like less than capable not the smartest bulb uh main character or and not that she wasn't but she didn't know she was capable and thus regularly didn't assume so but what i took mara to be is someone who in small simple tasks is she'll do it she's happy to do it she likes simplicity and so the idea and specifically she does not like being treated differently i think a lot of her anxieties especially later when she doesn't want people to realize she's a princess or treat her differently uh, she specifically gets a little weird when fenris figures out she's a princess um is that she doesn't want to be treated so i think her anxiety had more to do oh no people are going to treat me differently if they and and i'm not being told to muck the stable i should muck the stable and then people won't treat me differently uh which is how I read that scene. Um, yeah, that which, makes sense. It's not framed that way, but that yes. again, it's it, it makes sense, but it's a little, it sets you up differently than it ends up. Yes. No, a hundred percent. Anyway, uh, so she goes, she has a good time. She makes friends with, uh, and she's not actually a nun. She's here, she's living the life of a nun, but she hasn't been sworn to the order. Uh, and it is the convent of... Uh, our Lady of Grackles. Our Lady of Grackles, which I think it was Shauna who hated that it was Grackles, but I kind of loved it. <laughs> like <it's such laughs> a, every time she'd be like, "Our Lady of Grackles, help me!" I'd be like, "Grackles, <laughs> it's so great. I love it." 
this is a good and time to mention that the setting is kind of generic fantasy landia mm -hmm. um which i usually don't like but in this case i think works and again with the sort of vague fairy taleness of it i felt like it worked and i should point out that um you're intercutting between her trying to get the dog to work and talking with some other cannibals and this backstory and it's actually yeah. really beautiful very naomi novik esque uh, it was kind of lyrical and dark and strange and i was like i was really here for it yeah um and i i really liked it um i just i really liked it because i i like that kind of stuff in yeah. general and i think the strength in the first half is weaving between those two like that darker current timeline and this past that is building because you know something the minute you realize Dami is married off to Vorleg and she dies you already heard that our girl Mara is out to kill a prince so you know this bitch Vorleg is up to no fucking good and so there's this sense of dread mm -hmm. building as she's like uh, even while she's at the convent and she's getting news about her sister because uh, her mother sends her letters and it's just like your sister's fine like that's it and then the news she does get about her sister is almost always not great and so there's this nice buildup of dread because again you know Mara's gonna kill a prince and mm -hmm. you're waiting for that prince to do something fucked up and so you already what? know he he and she's in this here. land of like cannibals and stuff. And again, you're like, oh shit, is this gonna, how is this gonna play into it? And it doesn't. I at thought all. Vorlig did something. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. lie. I thought Vorlig did something to kill the earth. Um, and that this was what the Northern Kingdom used to be. And he was now like a giant monster thing that she had to go slay. That would have been awesome what i thought this book was gonna be when i started it but it's not guys not. um magical shana has a great point uh has t came for sure never been to a florida Publix fighting grackles for a parking spot as floridians fair point it's actually funny because birds get more bold um the higher the income level of a neighborhood i used to live in a, when i was younger a very um not very, but it was like more middle class. And um, <laughs> the ducks there, so entitled, so aggressive. They want food. Here in my lower income neighborhood, uh, no, they're scared. <laughs> you can't go up and feed them. They're like, we don't want to be dinner. <laughs> no, go away. Um, <laughs> that's such a weird aside. Will. She eventually gets a letter from her mama saying, uh, your sister's pregnant. And then she's like, oh, this is good news. And then it's your sister's having the baby. We have to go now to see, like, to be there. So she, her mom comes and picks her up. And then there's this fun conversation where she's in the car with her mom. And her mom's in this, like, elaborate gown. And she's like, do you want to look like a nun? Or do you want to, um, like, look like a princess? And she was like, mm -hmm. I kind of don't want to do that whole that's a lot of work <laughs> all those layers it's heavy i'll just i'll just stay in my nun's robes thanks and mom was like perfect we'll get you new nun's robes um and her mother is painted as a complex character in that her mom makes decisions that is best for the greatest number of people for her kingdom often at the expense of her family <clears throat> and uh it's it's complicated because like you you eventually have a very bad picture of her but then uh a, a character who is literally the one who ate the shit decision her their mom made uh it's like nah it's the decision that had to be made and i like that she's not uh, very few characters except for fucking vorleg are painted which i'm okay mm -hmm. with i'm 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 okay like Eh, I don't need all of my villains to have a really reasonable reason why they're doing the thing they're doing. Some humans are just fucking dicks and especially wife abusers. Like now nah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be sympathetic to those motherfuckers. Yeah, no, I felt like, so that's the next thing we find out is that, um, uh, Kanya is having her kid and, um, while her mother's out of the room, she grabs Mara and is like, don't, let you don't run away don't let them marry you to him you don't want if, to be part of if this if i die in yeah. childbirth run do not let mom convince you to marry him um and she she's like, and i really liked her relationship with kanya because kanya comes too. off as kind of a bitchy character which i thought she'd be your favorite yeah I, I do have a weakness again it's not good in real life um but uh but like there's this like they hated each other as kids and they still don't necessarily get along with like <laughs> their sisters you know like they they do care about each other and um what we find out later is okay so the book does this weird thing where it has like 
not a cul-de-sac, but like it's very anti-pregnancy for like a chapter or two um, because like childbirth is viewed as like not a great thing because she's taking care. When she goes back to the convent, Mara helps out like the local midwife or doctor and she talks about how like dangerous it is and how um uh, you know a lot of women die in it and like again the midwife at certain points is like you know like if i could kick out their husbands i would and, and stuff like that and like pregnancy and childbirth and death from childbirth is kind of a complicated topic when it comes to the middle ages um uh, much more so than now when it is significantly safer than it was and the whole idea of whether to be a mother or not um it is a complicated thing. And I felt like the book was like weirdly against it as a concept. Did I you didn't. not get that? <clears throat> I thought it was against multiple pregnancies at the expense of the woman's health. Cause the, the first uh, birth she goes through like was scary because she'd never been through anything like that. And even her first one with uh, like, I loved the fact that she saw Kanye giving birth thought like, this can't possibly be what's supposed to happen. Look at her back arching like that. Came, and then she sees the second one and she goes, oh, no, that's just birth. Um, and then it wasn't until she was watching people like go through pregnancy after pregnancy and seeing how it wrecked their body. That's what I thought it was more against. Mara didn't seem like uh, I at least that's how I read it, guys. What's your your input? Yeah, you that makes sense. But what I, when I say it's a cul-de-sac, it's like it doesn't come up later. The book, okay, the book has a weird amount of discussion of abuse without actually really making a point about it or it necessarily playing into the story. Yeah. It feels a little unfocused at times. So here's some uh, comments. Lindbergh says, I feel like Mara's views on childbirth is female inclusion because rarely are women who don't like or want to have children represented in books unless they are tomboys, which I yeah. agree. Uh, and then Angry Otter says, I thought it was about choice. It talks about women being broodmares and dying for it. Um, and then Seo says, I felt like the characters are against it, not so much the book. It was Mara's opinion. Yeah, the what I I got it in okay, in the sense of her sister who is being sacrificed to have multiple kids and stuff, like that I get. It was more some of the offhand comments about like the other peasants. But then part of it is I have a different um, there's a view of the Middle Ages as extremely patriarchal, and that's true, but it's not like in that time period, like women were chattel in, in how they were treated. There was actually a fair amount of, I wouldn't say equality, but like mutual power involved in how they navigated their circumstances. And so like, and also... I don't think it's like they didn't have very good birth control as part of the problem. You know what I mean? It's not necessarily a patriarchal concept that you like, if you don't have good birth control, you're going to end up with a lot of kids. See, for me, it was less about like, especially with the, the ladies that she was helping the sister apothecary with. It was more just seeing that like multiple births in close periods of times is just dangerous. Like, yeah, and you know, to be honest, it could also be her view being filtered through her relationship with Kanye. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it could it could actually be an interesting character detail that I just didn't necessarily pick up on. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah, so uh, Lindbergh says, uh, I recall the book mentioning that women being pregnant too soon after birth, but in the context of too soon for their bodies to handle, which was how I took it. Valerie says, I got the sense it was through Mara's eyes after seeing what was happening to Kanye. She was seeing pregnancies through a very personal lens, which I also completely Which is what I it. just said, and I think Valerie uh, put that in right after I said it, so nice. You're sniping my opinions, but go ahead. I'm just kidding. But no, it is interesting, I think, in terms of how it's... <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. This that was for you, Valerie. There was a, a point in one of our Hyperion videos where I, I said uh, an off-color joke, and Maria's like, this is why we can't do live streams, William. Um, so. It was so... <laughs> oh, boy. So funny. I was... <laughs> so funny. I was... <sighs> I don't. I don't. Uh, um, Rude, I was typing, says Valerie. I know, I'm, I'm kidding. It's yeah, very funny. Uh, we had that one scene where the farmer bur uh, the farmer buried the afterbirth to bless the child. It felt like to um, to some of the peasants, we got this idea of childbirth as sacred, which I do agree. It very much like it felt like this. Like she was like, "Why are you taking this weird thing? Like, why do I have to I give it to the team. husband?" Um, like Kanye was pregnant within six months of delivering her last child, for example. But today, most doctors will advise that you have at least nine months between pregnancies. Um, and then a and adding to that, that Mara herself never wanted children. So there isn't that longing or wanting to add uh, to filter her opinion either, uh, which like, 
All fair I mean, points. I, as someone who's also terrified of pregnancy, yeah, no, I, I, I was with Mara. This, this shit scary, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it Ooh. is, a, and I should point out, even today, it is a dangerous medical surgery almost in certain ways in terms of how you think about it and people think of it as very Especially safe and it, it, for women of color no hold on we need the credit say it again yeah especially for women of color the uh it, it's actually the, true the death rate is way yeah, higher women's uh medicine in general does not take female uh pain very seriously i don't know why i'm getting into this but particularly they do not take the concerns color, and pains of women of color seriously at all. Yeah. Okay. Good. We got the points. Um, but no, it really, and, and that's one of the things I, I, I realized as I grew older that you just have this sanitized view of childbirth as now being just a thing that happened, but no, it is a medical, it's sort of like surgery. <laughs> like surgery is not a thing your body is naturally meant to do. Humans to an extent aren't really meant to have kids with heads that large. And so it's not really safe in a lot of ways. And you always should think of pregnancy as a medical condition almost to an extent, if you guys know what I'm saying. But uh, I just think that's very timely nowadays with our Supreme Court. Um, anyway, so the next thing that happens that I <laughs> that I think is interesting is, uh, or not interesting, but the next thing that happens is Kanye's kid dies. Um, and yes. so... Mara goes over and it's interesting because up to this point, Mara has been like, how do I save Kanye? And so she's learning about contraceptives. She doesn't, to... she doesn't know she needs to save Kanye yet. We're oh, yeah, about yeah. to learn. After so after her daughter dies, uh, Kanye's daughter dies, uh, Mama and Mara go to visit uh, uh, Kanye again for the funeral. And it is during this funeral that she realizes she's pregnant. Kanye's pregnant again, not like super pregnant, but pregnant. And there's a point where Kanye says, um, she wants to go to the chapel to do a vigil for her daughter. Uh, and her husband's like, I will send my gods with you. And she's like, I was kind of hoping to do it alone. Perhaps my sister, the nun can go. And uh, another thing to know about the Northern kingdom, the King looks like he's 90, but he's only 50. And uh, a chatty uh, lady in waiting uh, tells Mara that the, a lot of the, um, northern uh kingdom royalty die very young um and that they think it's a curse and there's a fairy godmother you you see her at the child at kanya's daughter's christening which was an earlier scene um and the godmother is this old paper skinned woman who's given heck in pomp and circumstance like it, you could hear a pin drop when she walks into the chapel um and she blesses the child. And the blessing she says to the child is, um, no, basically, it's much more poetic than this, but no foreign magic can ever <laughs> hurt you, uh, can ever affect you. And you, uh, I shall protect you as I've protected all others. Your, my life is bound to yours as long as I draw breath. Um, and you're like, oh, that's a, and, and what you realize is this means no, no one can attack this kingdom with magic. Like you can't attack the royal family with magic. Their godmother, who's heck and super powerful, has got them saved. Um, and so, uh, back to the scene after the death. So, uh, she's, uh, oh, the king. Uh, and so Mara thinks he's like 90 and the ladies, the lady in waiting is like, nah, he's 50. And he like, his mind is going, it's not great. Um, and, but the king, when Kanye's like, I'd like to mourn my daughter, uh, with a visual by myself, the king's like, yes, right, proper. That's the way to do it. And Prince Vorlig is like, I think I should send my guards. And she's like, I'll take my sister, a nun, as chaperone. That shouldn't be too bad. And the king's like, ah, yes, you can do that. And Vorlex gives her a look like. And they go into the <laughs> they go into the chapel. And what Mara realizes, because she happens to see Kanye's wrists, it's covered in dark bruises that look like hand, like fingerprints from someone grabbing her. And Kanye just says, very matter of factly, he, I had to be punished for wanting to be alone from him. And what you learn is that this guy is so paranoid about her having an affair <clears throat> that he's incredibly controlling of her life. He doesn't let her be alone anywhere. There literally was a period when he first married her where he went away for like six months on a campaign. He came back. He would not sleep with her or touch her for nine months to ensure that no pregnancy with somebody else would get uh, misconstrued as him. his 
child. And she was like, that was the best point of my marriage because this guy's abusive. Damia died because this guy didn't learn how not to kill someone when you're abusing them. He went a bit too far. And the, one of the reasons Kanye specifically is actually trying to get pregnant all the time is because he is less abusive, less harmful when she's pregnant to uh, in the hopes of keeping the baby. She's had m several miscarriages by this point in the story as well. Um, and uh con like mara's like oh my god this guy's beating his pregnant wife and when she's not pregnant it's even worse and this is the moment where um she's like oh i've got to help her and so she goes to her mother once they're back in the northern realms because han is like you can't say anything to anyone if you breathe a word and he hears about it we are fucked um and uh so she goes to her mom and she's like mom queen it's funny because she doesn't know how to refer to her mom. She like almost calls her your majesty. And then she's like, mother. Uh, great. Um, and she's like, Kanye's being hurt. Vorlig's a, a jerk face. This is what's happening. And her mom goes, oh, yeah, I know. And you're like, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? And her mom is like, yeah, he's a piece of shit. Th that's what happened. It, 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 Kanye's best chance is to give him a son. Once he has a son, he will not give a shit about her anymore. And she can just like vibe on her own. And mm -hmm. you're like, maybe? Because Kanye was also like, eh, he might kill me once I give him what he wants. So not great. So Mara's like, nobody's going to help her. I'm going to have to help her. Well, and so the other thing about it is, especially in her discussion with Kanye, I felt like you really feel the claustrophobia and how trapped Kanye is because there's no one to go to. She can't go to the king because he's old and feckless. And what has Walrath's teeth, which I thought was cool. Um, and like, there's no one, there's no higher authority than the king to go to, which is a little ahistorical, but whatever, I'm not going to get into it. The, the story is making a point, not trying to be 100% uh, realistic. And one thing I would have liked is if her mother had emphasized, because her mother emphasizes like, hey, this is the only way our kingdom survives is through this marriage. Like, I have to sell you guys off for the kingdom. And I would have liked if she had just been like, yeah, you think your sister suffering is bad? What about like all of the people who would die in a war? You know, all the women who would die in a war. Like just because she's noble doesn't make her life necessarily more important than other people's. Um, and like, I just think that would have been maybe a little bit more interesting or a better way to frame it. Her mother is not framed necessarily badly. She is framed as somewhat ambiguous. Um, and I did like that a lot and that she is a woman who is making decisions she thinks is right even if they aren't necessarily or even if you disagree with them um which i really liked it's it's a really <laughs> nice or oh, are you reading thing yeah angry otter says i love how she's like okay i guess he has to die yeah it is pretty Done. funny <laughs> and then uh angry otter mara is a practical lady she is i love it for her one of the reasons um, maria likes her i think <laughs> I, I really just like Mara. There's mm -hmm. something so refreshing about her that I, I adore. <sighs> um, so Chelsea said, I actually love that the mother did acknowledge that Kanye's skill at managing the situation. Yeah, because Kanye is super, like, within the situation she's given, she's doing her goddamn best, and it's good. Yeah. Like, she's doing a good job. Anyway, so she goes back to the convent, and she'd previously been talking, like, she talked to the sister apothecary about, like, birth control, how to help her sister not get pregnant all the time, because she thinks, like, that'll help. Uh, but then once she realized that if her sister isn't pregnant, this guy's going to continue beating her, she's like, oh, God, what am I going to do? And eventually she talks to someone, and they mention a dust wife. And she's like, oh, yeah, dust wives are a thing. Because, like, she can't get help from, like, anyone locally. It's not like the if she goes to the abbess, the, the, the lady's going to be like, yes, I'll help. I, I'm a nun. I'll help you kill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and she's listening to someone talk about the dust wife. And what the dust wives are, are they're kind of like hedge witches. But specifically, they live by graveyards. And they put the dead to rest. Like, you, they'll bury the dead. But they can also commune with the dead. And they have magic powers. And Kanya's like, or uh, Mara's like, okay, I have to go find a dust wife. So she goes and she finds the nearest, like she sneaks out of the, the she packs herself some stuff. She sneaks out of the convent um, and she goes and she finds the local dust wife. And the local dust wife is like, so yeah, I kind of bury dead and I've got like a skosh of magic, but I'm not really a dust wife. Like I just fill that role in this area, but I am not a legit dust wife. If you want a legit dust wife, there's this lady really close to the blistered lands 
in this particular area. You should go see her, but she's in the Southern Kingdom. So then Mara has to go on a long journey trek to the Southern Lands. And it's great because I am, I'm not one of those people, uh, but I am familiar with the feeling, I guess a little bit, you know, when you have to do something you've never done before, like, and it requires a social interaction, you've never had to like navigate and you get really nervous about it. Like I have friends who to this day, they hate calling and making doctor's appointments with that for themselves or like that. She's going, talking about me. Transparently. It, I, it's I have it, well, not just you. Yeah, I, know. I have several friends that have this issue. <laughs> I, I, literally have dated multiple men where I would call and make their hair appointments, you know, like, because I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I don't care. Um, One of the reasons my hair in these videos oscillates between massive and tiny is because I hate the social interaction of having to sit in a chair and talk to somebody for two, for like 20 minutes. I just can't do it. And anything that requires me to call anyone is just, again, I vibe hard with Mara in terms of her issues, uh, her like anxieties. And stuff like that. Um, it just isn't always that much fun to read. But um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so she she like she has to get a carriage and she's like, What do I say? What's this interaction? It's just fucking hysterical. Because then she just gets in the carriage. But um, while she's in the carriage, she learns the valuable lesson because there's this guy giving her a fucking hard time. And then this lady pipes up seeing this and goes, Leave the nun alone. And um uh mar like the guy immediately starts treating mara differently and the lady says if guys are giving you a hard time lean into the nun thing men are polite to nuns and she does she starts making sure she wears her lady of the grackles necklace on the outside making sure her robes look really nun like and she has an easier time but then she began like the next time she has to get a carriage she's fine and she sleeps with the in the carriage as a, a night and this is kind of how she gets through um her travels and eventually she gets kind of close to the blistered lands and she's actually happy seeing them to see how far away they are from her kingdom uh at this point and she goes to the dust wife and the dust wife is this cranky old uh not even cranky but like just this like solid i imagine her like a solid like yeah she's like woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's very kind of practical and a little sour and like, yeah, a little grumpy, I think it would be. There, There is a word for it that I'm not remembering. But yeah, it's kind of yeah. adjacent to that. I liked her too, though. And I like what happens with her a little bit. But like, I did feel like she was a little too stock at times uh, of a character um, without being complicated. But that's, again, kind of what happens in the second half of the book. But yeah, yeah. Um so yeah she gets there and the dust wife is like oh you want to kill a prince ah okay i'll give you you have to complete these three tasks and if you do these three things i'll uh i'll help you and she's like you need to make a uh cloak of from uh owl cloth and nettles uh and then you need to make a bone dog make a dog out of bones and then you gotta um get me at the moon in a jar uh and so thus we connect back to what was happening at the beginning of the book which is uh mara making the cloak of the nettle owl cloth and the dog uh the the bone dog and it's really great because the and there was a lot of discussion in the comments while i was going through like her as a nun earlier about like what is owl cloth and basically it's like cloth that has nettles in it but when you touch it it's not just that the nettles are sharp and they hurt you it physically is painful like like she touches it and it's just her entire hand is convulsing. And basically what she has to do, because she tries like wrapping her hand in something to affect it, but she can't. She needs her hand to be dexterous because at this point she's just weaving, which means she's sending like she's got the lumen, but she's got to hold it to send it through. And so she uses her, she saves her right hand for the um, like fine work that has to happen later. And she actually has to like take the thread and like knit it crochet it into a usable fucking cloak um and it fucks up her hand like she is not doing good but she ends up doing it and and this is one of those scenes that will was talking about earlier that feels really flipping dark it's like, so dark she's like hurting herself to do it she's not sure her hand is ever gonna work again it hurts as someone by the way who cuts themselves way too much because i like to make uh tabletop miniatures you're not gonna be able to see it i cut my hands all the time so i felt that not yeah. all the time. I used to cut my hands a lot. Now I don't. But um, yeah, like and in her hand is like a claw by the end. And I was like, uh, oh, my God, this is so dark. And then she has great, to go but... make the bone dog. And that's why she has to go into the blistered lands because she has to find like a specific 
a grave and she's literally using this metal wire and attaching it to these bones and her hands have cuts in them and, and you can see the the infection kind of going through her hand like spidering yeah and her hands are valerie swollen. says that i love that her pinky is still numb near the end of the book because of this very true actually i cut my thumb so badly one time that i still it's still a little numb even a year later uh actually like two years later but yeah like that's a real thing and i did like that it wasn't just forgotten though i kind of thought it was going to be one of these things where like with fairy tale like at the end of the night she realizes oh my hand is okay um but no it's, yeah yeah so she comes back to the dust wife and she's like i got a bone dog <laughs> and i i got a cloak and nettles made from owl cloth uh, and the dust wife was like, God damn it. And she's like, Mara's confused by this reaction. And she's like, you weren't supposed to do that. She's like, do you know why we give people impossible tasks? Because they're impossible and they're not supposed to do them. You were supposed to start doing them, give up and fuck off. And she's like, now I have to help you. And then, but Mara's like, I didn't do the last one. I didn't give you a jar full of like the moon. And the dust wife literally grabs something off of her shelf, hands it to Mara and says, now give it back to me. And then she opens it and it's, a jar with moonlight in it uh and and but mara's like but i didn't actually do it she goes again you weren't supposed to do any of it that's not the fucking point i'll help you but first we got to go to a goblin market uh to get some supplies uh and i also love that the dust wife has this cloak that has a bunch of pockets and she just puts mm -hmm. like random shit in it and then she has this giant staff and there was a point earlier in the book where she was like watch out for the brown hen she's she's got a demon in her and at the time mara's just like wow that must be a really bitchy brown hen no it's actually got a demon in her a little I love demon this. i love this demon chicken so much demon, demon chicken and demon chicken finder and bone dog uh, yeah. the trifecta this the trifecta book really animals. has adorable animals really set because bone oh, dog because we should say that the bone dog sh like animated and now keeps acting like a real dog around her like he keeps trying to lick her face despite not having a tongue, tongue. he likes sitting on her even though like his hip bone hurts because there's no fur there <laughs> several points he like tries to lick you know how like dogs lick their crotch and like there's nothing there for him to lick but he seemed very satisfied um it's... which was like there's just some great moments like that let me tell you bone dog is literally the best like tie a bow on it i cried for him i sobbed in a car it was great i love bone dog read this book for bone dog alone you'll have a great time um and it, it, valerie points out a really uh great uh great uh what are we what are we naming Maybe. the dog made of bones uh bone dog yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's it mara's not the most creative anyway so uh they take bone dog and she's like yeah we can't travel with bone dog because it's literally a dog made out of bones but like nobody's gonna be okay with that so they have to go to uh the goblin market and to get there the dust wife has to summon a dead thing the dead thing gives them decorations but kind of wants to drown mara and the dust wives get you go like fuck off <laughs> and i just love her matter of factness uh, it's one of the things i like about her but anyway they get to the bone uh the goblin market and while they're there um they buy a moth Mara has to give up uh, some of her life. And it was at this point that I realized, oh, this isn't zombie cannibal book. Mm -hmm. This isn't zombie cannibal fantasy fairy tale book. This is, we're now in fae, like classic fairy tale realm. Okay, I guess we're not dealing with the zombie cannibals. Again, There's I think also this a shift there's also a shift in terms of the magic because the magic at the beginning, even as she's animating the dog, feels very dark and like un, um, conven not unconventional, but not order it in the way that a magic system usually is and like kind of mystical and creepy um and then it's like oh no but there's a goblin market and then later on you figure out there's a lot more like just straight up magic stuff and like again that's a tone shift where it's like no we're not doing mysterious kind of fairy tale we're doing like again not the construction of fairy tale tropes but like kind of that feeling like we're not taking them totally seriously like again uh the bone wife at one point is like or the dust wife is like um the weapon isn't a sword that would be really convenient unfortunately it's me and i'm gonna have to go with you like yeah, it's like a, a bit of a subversion great. there yeah i forgot that that was such a good line um yeah, that's a great one. yeah so th they end up buying a moth which costs about a week of mara's life um and uh the moth will lead them to the thing they need and it's just like human like tall jacked human guy like in his 40s that is just working in this one stall um and they're like can we can we get can we buy that guy and he was like yeah uh and then he wants like five years of mara's life and then the the bone wife's like 
what about a tooth from a nun? And he's like, I'll take a tooth from a nun. And Mara's <laughs> like, I don't see it. I'm the nun. Oh, no. Um, and then there's this great scene where there's this, like, tooth dancer So creepy. Who has like a beak, but also like a face underneath? Like it's it was ooh, that was that was an interesting scene, and it dances her tooth out of her mouth, crazy. Um, but yeah, so they get Fenris, and Fenris is this like tall, hulking, like very proper. He used to be a knight. He used to be a diplomat. I really liked that combo because normally they're just like knight, like like the uh, paladin dudes, and he was also diplomat, and I I liked that combo. But anyway, so they get Fenris. They have to get out of the goblin market. Um, they get to know him a little bit. He is banished from his original kingdom because he killed a guy. This guy killed his son for a really stupid, not Fenris's son. This guy killed his own son for a really, 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 really dumb reason. And Fenris, it's, it blames himself for it. And so he killed the guy. And, but unfortunately, that guy was a lord. And so now Fenris is wanted for murdering a clan lord. Uh, not great. So he escaped but fell asleep in a fairy circle. And that's why he was indebted to the tooth guy. Anyway. Uh, so they, they go off traveling and eventually as they finally get into her land, she remembers that she had a godmother because um, they're like, how are we going to deal with the godmother's curse or the godmother's blessing that keeps magic from affecting anyone in the royal family? Because the, the dust wife is she got magic, but that doesn't work <laughs> if you don't have uh, like if you can't use the magic. Um, and so they're like, we'll go we'll go visit your uh, godmother partially because at this point Mara's pissed like why did you bless us with health health so my sister can survive all these pregnancies and be beaten and not die? like and she's just mad and then she also blames her godmother for because her sister Damia it was health and you will marry a prince and she's like it's your fault that she married Vorleg and so she's kind of pissed so they decide to go visit her Fenris is really useful he chops wood a lot uh which g gets some food and shelter sometimes and like useful things and uh, at this point and a couple of people said they don't like the romance in this but this romance works exactly in the kind of ways that I as an adult really like which is it's super subtle it's really like it's tiny little nothing moments and it's like he's chopping wood and Mara's like what <laughs> there's a point later where Agnes is like he looks pretty good shirtless am I right Which yeah I, thought was I, love, very funny. I love Agnes man anyway um so yeah, I that so I, I didn't love the romance it's um it's not bad by any means it's really not bad it's pretty to me it was pretty much like unnoticeable almost more than anything else there isn't really fever touch but there is like a certain amount of like uh there is a not fever touch but like warm touch to them i felt like um but it's better put together it's better set up than a lot of other ones it, it happens later so it's not as egregious okay egregious egregious yes okay that was weird but but in so in the book's defense, the only time there's a warm touch is when it's, they're literally outside in the cold and their backs are touching and providing mm -hmm. warmth, which is like step there's one. There's a few times where like he takes her hand and she's like, oh, you took my hand. But again, yeah. it's towards the end of the book, so it's a little bit more earned um, yes. than, than earlier. But I like it. Um, I, it was okay. Again, it was okay. I didn't find it annoying, um, unlike a lot of the ones we've read. I just didn't particularly ship it myself. I did um, ship it. I love the idea of this tiny, scared little nun and this like jacked diplomatic knight who like does manual labor and them just like not talking about it, but it being there and like like being into each other. And I was like, shut up and kiss each other, you damn, because they're adults. And I'm like, what are you, teenagers? Just do it, my guys. Like, oh man. Also, how old is he? Because she kept saying he was old, and I was like, is he like an? Okay. No, he's 40. There's literally a point where the dust wife says, talk to me and say you're old because he called himself old. Right. Okay. And yeah. I thought he was like almost was like, 50 is what that was. No. The dust wife said, talk to me when you're 70. And he goes, that's 30 years hence. He 40. Yeah, She's well, 30. Math, so she should have said it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do math at all. So I was just like, <laughs> I, I don't remember. Uh, that's old, I think. But uh, yeah, go ahead. Um. But yeah, so uh, they travel on. They end up getting to her um, fairy godmother and they get in and they're talking to her and Mara like yells at her and basically says terrible things and she just starts crying. What you realize is Agnes yeah. is this like 
wait go you gotta you gotta introduce it properly they come up yeah. on agnes and she's like this little old lady living in a hut but she's like doing it she's wrong round she's like very like oh and she like she's not setting up for winter properly and there are too many chickens around and she's very like inviting but very high strung uh i i got the sense like she's by far my favorite character and like um and then what you find out is like yeah she's not really good at at, at blessings like the only reason she gave them good health was because it's the only one she can really do which i thought was just so relatable yeah uh, and she and was she she's actually like a bastard child of the court who's just kind of happy she gets invited to family events sometimes yeah she's, loved her she's so like you don't she's like you don't know why i'm the fairy godmother she's like i'm your great great aunt and you're like okay she's been alive for a while but it's just like she's so cute and she cries because she's like it's i thought it was health's a good health's a good blessing and then the dust wife is like the health is a great blessing and is staring at mara like what the fuck are you doing mara's yeah. like oh man i just yelled at a woman who just did the best she could and was like trying her little hardest and mm -hmm. i was like oh man it's so cute um and what you actually discover about agnes and you don't discover it now but like agnes it's not that because she she sells herself as weak like she's a weak fairy godmother and as a fairy godmother yes but she's not actually really a fairy godmother she's she's skilled at curses she can curse shit but she chooses not to because it's that's not the kind of person she wants to be but she's she's got a lot of dark magic in her um and it's funny because when she tells like her mother had like clo uh like horse feet like cloven uh or it might have been goat i don't know uh, and slept with like the old king um and so she was just like the bastard daughter of the king from a couple generations ago it's super interesting but anyway so uh they're like okay this is our quest this is what we're gonna do and the godma like agnes is like well i guess i'm gonna come along uh i've gotta go and mara's like no why the heck we do need to go and she's like oh, i'm a fairy godmother you never know when that could be useful Kanye's pregnant again uh fairy godmothers are often invited like i'm her fairy godmother i'd be invited to this so i could be useful and the dust wife is like yes i agree so we end up with this like ragtag group we got the dust wife and her demon chicken who stands on her staff we got bone dog heckin adorable rattle rattle oh while they were at the um uh goblin market they got him a uh glamour so he looks like a dog now uh if you he does he don't bark though which is hysterical um and you got fenris jacked older uh well not older but jacked uh diplomat and then you got mara <laughs> well none uh, i don't even know if she's short but in my head she was very like slight as a human um uh it's mentioned at one point that uh yeah mara's kind of small and stout yeah oh yeah she has a round face they all have round face and slightly darker skin like she I describes also her the... mom yeah go ahead she describes her mom as looking like a commoner like just like a common low-born woman with like a round practical face and i loved that i also got the impression that they were um yeah no they were just kind of round and stout and it's mentioned at one point that her mother looks royal because she's very careful with how she dresses and she like is yeah. is very good about that which I, is a detail i like but yeah i like that this is sort of like an unconventional fellowship you know that they are yep. going on it's two old ladies mostly um again it's it's sort of a bit of a uh, an inversion of the normal fairy tale tropes um and the thing is that's just so not the feeling of the first half of the book as much as it like i not. like agnes you're like this is a different book it is and that's the i think one of the fundamental issues with it yeah. as much as i really enjoyed it that, that definitely is an issue anyway so they go on they get to the um northern kingdom they go in and basically uh their plan is uh they have to find a way in and like kill Vorlig and they're like okay how are we gonna do it and they're like well we can't do anything until that godmother's thing is gone and uh Agnes is like oh I forgot when they first get to the city and they need a safe place to sleep oh yeah this was weird <laughs> she's like I'll try bless a, a baby she's like I need a baby and then I can help us and they were like a baby and Fenris is like a human and she's like no an animal so they get a little chick a little black little chick uh and she she tries blessing it to help them find a good place and it doesn't work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work so then she curses it basically help us find a safe place or else you will die <laughs> and the little chick is like ah! <laughs> and takes them to this like in the poorer quarter of the capital of the northern um 
kingdom a little uh like a, a house and there's a young girl who's like yeah that's miss margaret's house like sh she does take lodgers but most people don't go there because of him and you're like who the fuck is him and let me tell you i had a lot of thoughts of who him might be i was not mm -hmm. fucking prepared this was one of the creepiest things i have read in a long ass time holy shit Ah! It was it was a twist, um, and it goes to I think the book having like themes of abuse there that don't necessarily go anywhere. But like they go there, and what they find is that it's this lady who kind of speaks kind of faintly and has a a marionette perched on her shoulder that has like a, a monkey. A, yeah, and it has like a a, a a rope around her neck that like controls her, and like it doesn't like when she talks to other people. And the dust wife is like, oh, it's a cursed child. And what you find out, okay, I wasn't positive about how this worked, but basically what you find out is that like from a young age, they get these. And the way she describes it is like, it's a personal God to the person who has it because it takes all of their attention, um, which again is like kind of a metaphor for abuse. Um, and so like, you know, Mara is like, okay, why don't we just like get rid of it and burn it? And she's like, yeah, that doesn't work great because a lot of times they don't want you to like, it's, you can't just take away someone's personal God after talk about Years. personal gods. Maria's cat Hi. is like, okay, mine. <laughs> this, this my little personal God. Um, but yeah. And, and the less wife's like, ah, when we leave, I'll offer to like help her uh, with it. So it's basically Miss Ally Snow is uh, if you love, uh, if you if you have a toy and love it hard enough, it kind of starts to become sentient. Um, and the other, uh, and then uh, Valerie said, uh, usually they get burned before adolescence. And what it is, is like, if you've gone through like, and they, uh, there is definitely an abuse analog, but like the child clutches to this thing enough that it gives it enough power. Um, but Margaret is an older woman and she still has this thing who, and it'll pull the string on her neck to get her to stop talking. It was... I did not expect weird demonic demon puppets mm -hmm. sitting on a woman's shoulder, like yanking her. To, like, holy crap, very off putting, terrifying. Mara's like, we cannot stay here. And they were like, find her. That's what uh, Agnes named the little chick that sleeps in her boobs. Um, find her, found her for us, and said it was safe. Can so, I just say that I really, I didn't expect the book, but I definitely thought there was going to be a, um, to keep this. Uh, YouTube friendly, a rooster joke later in the book. Um, and there is a little bit, but they don't use the language that would have made it really funny if you guys know what I mean. I love puns. I know. Um, and so their basic plan is uh, Agnes is like, well, I I'll go visit her as a godmother. Like, I can go visit her. Like, we we talk to each other. Like, it's a thing. We'll talk She'll shop, talk essentially. You. Because the godmother talks to no one. And so they're like, okay, Mara will go with her because Mara is unrecognizable. And the other thing that they're also doing is the way to get into the palace is through... Um... Oh, no, they don't do this yet. Anyway, so she goes, Mara and Agnes go to talk to uh, the godmother of the Northern Kingdom. Um, and while they're there, Mara, like, the the northern kingdom's godmother like puts mara like it's basically a distraction distraction spell to keep her from being able to listen to what her and agnes are talking about um and while she's there she sees these tapestries that are really weird and like don't look pretty and mara's like god why did you make such ugly fucking tapestries like my my lady i could have helped you this is real weird it doesn't make like logical sense um and then uh yeah so then uh, at the end of it, when she finally comes out of it and she's talking to Agnes and Agnes, she was like, wow, that's weird. Did you have that too? And Agnes was like, no, she just, she just made you distracted so her and I could talk. And then she's like, did you learn something? And she's like, I learned everything. And basically what you discover is this fairy godmother is kind of like stuck. Uh, years ago, the very first king of this kingdom kind of tied her, like uh, defeated her and then tied her to his lineage. Really quickly. Valerie says, I love Mara being a bitch about other people's weaving. It is very funny, and it's kept up that she's like a good seamstress. Yeah, there's a part earlier in one of the uh, our patrons mentioned it in the chat that like there's a point where she's looking at her mother's needlework and she's like, mm, not <laughs> great. You might be great at ruling, Mama, but your your uh, your fabric stuff could use some work. And it's great. Um, anyway, and what so what they learn is that this 
godmother has no choice. She has to bless these children. And it's not actually a blessing. It's a curse. Because the guy basically said, you have to live forever and uh, protect my family. And the only way for her to live forever is to feed off of them. So when she says, and my life is bound to yours as long as I draw breath, it literally means they are giving her life. And that's why all the fucking royal family, the kings and anyone who was blessed by her, is losing their life. She is literally sucking out of them. But she doesn't want to. She wants to die. She's been doing this for so long. She is done. She is tired. She's done. But she can't die. She absolutely can't. So she just like sits and does nothing and drinks tea. And then when she needs to, she goes and she blesses, bless curses some babies. So they're like, okay, this is great. The godmother is not going to stop us. If we free her and let her die then we'll be able to attack Vorlig and magic will work and we'll be we'll be in a good position. Great. Now they have to, like, how are they going to do this? And the Dustwife is like, because uh, Mara mentions one of the ways they can get into the palace secretly is there's that entire underground, uh, you learn that all the dead of the royal family are in, like, an underground, uh, crypt. like, crypt. But, like, with hallways and rooms, like, it's it's massive. And she's like, if we, like, the, the old king has to be in there. All of their dead are there. And, and then she was like, perfect. He's definitely, because she goes, what if his ghost isn't there? And like that's why it's like, if he still has control over, like, if this spell that is keeping the dust wife alive is still going, then he's still there. We can find him. So they have to send Fenris in, pretending he's a stone worker, <laughs> a mason, uh, to, like, figure out how to get in. And then they, they all have to go in one day. And they've got, like, the, the queen gives birth. Kanya gives birth to a boy. Uh, I forgot to mention. The king dead. Vorlig's now king. Kanya's queen. She gives birth to a son. Everybody's super pumped. They have three days before the christening. And that's their moment to get this shit done. Uh, so they go under the uh, palace. They're going through the crypts. A lot of shenanigans happen. There's a giant wheel of bones. It's called a thief wheel. Crazy. <laughs> Fun time. There's an angry old queen who got replaced and buried alive. Crazy shit. They eventually find the king. And this is where the dust wife really gets to like stress strut her stuff. There were previous times where her like chicken, who's a demon, uh, did some interesting things. But like the dust wife and the old king basically have to duel. And like the chicken is like pecking at his death mask. She's slamming her staff against the walls. And it's this kind of like cool buildup of a scene. Uh, and then basically she's like, yeah, I, he's not completely gone, but I got rid of his grip on the, uh, world enough that the dust white, that the, uh, godmother can like, she can die. And so they're like, great. So then they're like, how do we get out? We don't remember it. Cause they got turned around. Everybody got like bamboozled scattered. Um, and so they don't know how to get out anymore. And, um, I forgot to mention the godmother had given, like when Mara was sitting there staring at the ugly tapestries, the godmother went, oh, do you know what? these are and she was like nope i have no idea then she's like good i'm gonna give it to you and she just cuts a section of one of the tapestries and was like here you go um and mara realizes looking at the like pathways and then taking out that scrap that it is a map it is directions to a way out of this like maze of things and that the the dust wife because she is sworn to protect the royal family couldn't give it to Mara if she knew what it was. But because she didn't know it was a map, she could give it to her. And this was her way of giving them like a little help. Uh, very quickly, by the way, for people who aren't reading the chat, and if this is a later video, you won't see it. But Celia says, uh, Maria talking about a queen bearing, being buried alive. The chat, chicken mission impossible. Because yeah, they've been doing a whole like, um, <laughs> insert mission impossible music, dun, 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 mission impossible music, a chicken walks in. Missing uh, insert chicken noises. Yeah, you, they're, they're very funny. You should join our patrons. They're lovely people. And I'm so cool. dead. I had no idea. I love <laughs> yeah, you guys. Yeah, reading Mwah. along. Uh, Amazing. Um, um, Chelsea says the scene where she's battling the king. That was the worst scene for me. It's just Mara standing there watching a chicken pecking at a mask while the godmother's like, wow, that's really good. She's doing so well. So I actually felt that too, that it was like a little bit anticlimactic. Anti I did like the, uh, the aspect of like, the king is super haughty and he's like, ah, oh, you peasant. And then the dust wife is just like, ah, look, she hitches up her sleeves and has her magic chicken go to attack. Like I did like that aspect of it. And like, she just has, she's just winning, but like it did feel kind of anticlimactic and like, oh, okay. This is why we brought the, the dust, the dust wife this whole way. Like we needed her to do something and this is what she can do. Um, 
I did kind of like that, that everyone had a specific thing that they were supposed to do and you didn't know what it was until it happened. You know, like, uh, you originally think that Agnes's purpose is to get information on the old godmother, and that's not it. That's not what Agnes is here for. Fenris, you kind of know what his thing is going to be. Foul. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Good times. Oh, I love this, guys. You, you're the best. Um, uh, so I get that, but I'm, I'm also okay with, like, it's a tool. It's a weird tool that you don't know what it's for until you need it kind of thing. Um Anyway, so uh, once they they get out, they the map that the Dustwife had given them, the tapestry thing, leads them to the Dustwife's temple, like her little house. And they get there, and she's still alive. And she's like, I'm about to die, but I was hanging on. And she like she's like, which one of you? She's like, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. And then she sees the Dustwife, and she's like, thank you. I don't know why you helped me, but thank you. I am very ready to die. And uh, the Dustwife's like, I uh, I did it because a friend asked. And um, at the last minute, she's like, Agnes, like, she starts flaking, like, it, flaking and there's brown, not even white bone, brown bone underneath. This, this bitch has been alive for way too long. Um, and she's like, Agnes, before I die, I'd just like one more sip of tea. So Agnes is like giving her, it was just such, I loved the scene. It was, it was a yeah, cool it was vibe. Great. Um, anyway, the Dustwife, dust or not the dust wife the fairy godmother literally poofs into some like dust and bones okay hold on hold on i gotta go full screen for this lindbrick said someone do an impeccable joke so good guys so good so good Stop. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are too great um so uh, one person said, Miss Ali says that this was definitely the weakest part for me because stuff goes so smoothly and the tapestry thing wasn't as clever as the author thought it was. I think that's my problem is that everything here goes super, like there's no mid heist twist where it's like, <gasps> the, you know, the, um, the, something goes wrong and then we got to reschedule, not reschedule. Well, actually reschedule is a funny way of saying the heist has to change. But like everything goes really smoothly and like all the tools, all the Chekhov's guns fire well and there's nothing wrong. And it's also kind of like everyone had one job and they did it versus it being like more complicated. Um, and yeah, so like, I, I, again, I feel like it's a little bit, it's okay for like a young adult book, but I felt like for the older part of it and again how dark parts of this book are it's kind of a mismatch yes save the cat calls it the high tower surprise yeah i, mean, I should read that book but yeah I've, I've heard of that i don't know what the tv tropes call it which is the definitive trope namer but um but yeah so it was just like things work out but uh mara has to go to the temple to be like i'm the sister of the queen let me in and then what they decide is that the dust, the, the godmother's gone, so somebody has to bless the baby. And at this point, that's the other issue. By doing this thing and attacking the king, the old king, the dust wife is out. She's got no magic left. She is drained dry. So she can't do anything. And Agnes is like, it's going to have to be me. I'll do something. And they were like, can you? And she's like, everybody's like, yeah, she got a lot of evil magic in her. She'll figure something out. Um, so, uh, everybody in the castle is like, where the fuck is the godmother? She's always on time. She's always on time. Uh, Mara gets in and she's like, I, I, my cart was late. I'm here for my sister and the christening of her baby. And she gets in and Connie's like, Mara? And Mara's mom is like, Mara? What, what are you guys doing here? And she was like, I was coming the, uh, and then they're like, where's the godmother? Where's the godmother? And she was like, I don't know. Everybody's looking for her. I haven't seen the godmother <laughs> anywhere. Um, and then Agnes comes in and she comes in really tall with these glowing green eyes looking real heckin' scary. She's like, I am the replacement godmother. Your godmother's dead. Um, and she goes, I shall bless this baby. And everybody's like frozen, like, cause she kind of looks terrifying and she like touches the baby. She's like, I bless you to grow up without a father. Also health. <laughs> Well, I curse you to grow up without a father, without a father, which I like because it's an inversion of like, okay, curses can be good. Because one yeah. of the things she said earlier on was like, you know, I can't curse babies. Like, that's such an awful thing to do. And I, I did like, I thought that was clever. I was yeah. like, oh, okay. She gets to use her powers for good. And a, a curse can be good. Um, and then Lindbergh says, the book could have done an ounce with the Witcher in it. Yeah, it did have that feel at a certain point because the Witcher has like the law of surprises or I didn't mm -hmm. really watch the series or read the books. Um, but I know. I, I know. But uh, yeah, it did feel a little bit like that. 
Miss Alice, you know, I love how Agnes goes all Maleficent, does her thing, picks up her skirts and runs the <laughs> fuck out of there when she gets shit done. So, yeah. so she And also of, what's hilarious is she's super tall. Everyone thinks she's super tall and evil looking. And Agnes is actually just kind of like a stout woman, yeah. um, which I thought, yeah, was hilarious. Um, so she she does the curse and then the king like eventually comes. By the, by the way, sorry, but like throughout the comment, the chats this whole time, there has been a rewrite going on and says Fenris becomes a witcher and they go back to deal with the cannibals. Earlier, they talked about how Bone Dog and Demon Chicken should be fighting off the cannibals. It's there's a rewrite going on in the comments here, making it about cannibals, and I'm here for it. Yes, definitely something that should happen. Um, and uh, so like they're like attack that godmother and so she literally skedaddles hikes up her skirts skedaddles and then like everybody's like what's happening blah 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 and then she's like oh god oh god like uh this shit's gonna go bad because also godmother came uh in uh agnes came in with bone dog you know to add for the fierceness so then everybody starts attacking bone dog and mara's like no not my heckin bone dog and like they're going after him and she's like Fenris Fenris where the fuck are you what are you doing I need you to save Bone Dog and then there's this part where she's literally there's too many people going at him he grabs someone's kneecaps and then uh, a spear comes down and just shatters him and he flies mm. into pieces everywhere and I was literally in the car driving to D&D last night and I just started crying because I was like I did not think this book was gonna kill Bone Dog like yeah, I was me not neither. prepared and so I'm just crying and then like Fenris like while the, everyone's distracted by that like you hear the king scream something and then it gets cut off and everybody turns and it's Fenner standing next to the king pulling a sword out. Um, and you're like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> he just killed him. And, and like, the thing is, Mara thought that the curse was just going to like, eventually he would like fall tripping down the stairs yeah. or, like, have a heart attack. Uh, and Fenris was like, no, 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 I can do it now real quick. I got you. And the thing that has been happening in the background is Fenris uh, has been ready to die for a while. Like he made his decision when he slept in the fairy circle that he was going to die but uh, in like um, a way. And, and so the entire time he's like, this is a fool's errand. We're all probably going to die. And if I die, that's okay. And Mara, especially as she's getting a little warm to Fenris's form, uh, is like, no, do not die, Fenris. And he was like, mm -hmm. and so she's like, oh my God, he's decided to die. Because then everybody's like going after him. Mara is looking at him and Kanya, who has put everything together really fucking quickly, is like, no, don't kill him. I, uh, obviously, somebody is trying to attack our country. We must we must in interrogate him to get information. Uh, I will I will not stand for him to die. Take him and, and put him in prison so we can interrogate him later. Uh, we need to find out what nation is trying to kill us. And like she really turned it around real quick. Um, mm -hmm. And then I know this is a moment of high. Uh, things but there is we got to talk about this uh, Lindbergh said it's the only book I've ever read that introduced cannibals in chapter one <laughs> and then forgot all about them yes Chelsea oh. says hey Will don't leave find her out of our cannibal rewrite which is the chick if you guys remember um, and it, also Celia says also please make the, th the thumbnails reads where are the where cannibals, are the cannibals? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, no, it's great. Uh, we need the cannibals. Justice for the cannibals also is, is yeah. pretty good. So, oh, you know, oh, cannibals, yeah. wherefore art thou? Um, yeah, uh, I'm doing that right now. I'll see if I can finish it while Maria finishes the summary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, um, and, and basically Kanye manages to save, uh, Fenris at least to get him from being killed now. She also plausibly makes it. She was like, my sister, that's what you were trying to tell us earlier. Because Mara was trying to say something. The words weren't coming out. She was like, you were coming to warn us about everything. And Mara was like, yes, indeed I was. And so she takes the, like, nobody's now going to look at Mara and be, like, suspicious. Um, and uh, Kanye and Mara's mom is like, yeah, you might have to kill that guy. I don't know how you're going to get away with not killing him. He literally, like, killed your husband. I know he was helping. But, like, you got to do what you got to do. Um, and eventually they hatch a plan. So Kanye also manages to consolidate power in her favor where she's like, my son is now king, but he needs a regent. Uh, I will be regent, but I shall not stand alone. And she picks the two most powerful men who were vying for power, who would have tried to take it from her. And she asks them to be co-regent. Smart plan. Super smart. Kanye's a badass bitch. Um, and basically, Mar gets a plan where uh, instead of, like, hanging Fenris, she's like, why don't you say that his crime is to be buried alive in the tomb with your husband? And then me and uh, the dust wife can later go and uh, 
save him from that. But an important conversation that happens between Kanya and Mara before they go save Fenris is that she says, you need to leave. Mom, now that Vorlig is gone and mom doesn't have to worry about him not wanting anyone, you know, not wanting you to have kids. She's going to try marry you off to whatever other thing is the most valuable. And Mara's kind of like pissed and, and she's like, Kanye's like, nah, that's what, that's what mom has to do to make our kingdom, our country, our people, the safest. She will do what she has to do, but you don't have to be part of it. She can't, she can't use you if she can't find you. And Mara's like, bet I'm out. Um, so uh, they rescue Fenris, who now has claustrophobia issues because he was in a tiny little thing. It had holes in it, but, you know, claustrophobia issues. Uh, and they go, the dust wife and Agnes decide they're going to, like, live together, which I just, well, I loved. No, uh, Agnes decides that they're going to live together. She's like, yeah, of course we're going to live together after this, but you got to be less grumpy all the time. <laughs> well, because the dust wife is like, I think it would be best for you to stay with me, Agnes, uh, and not be on, like, you can't go back to your own place because eventually oh, they'll figure yeah. out you were the godmother. And Agnes was like, of course. Everybody didn't think that. I thought that's what we were doing. <laughs> and it's just like, I love the idea of them being like two roommates, but like, like live in this cute little yeah, no, life mismatched together. Roommates. Yeah, yeah, she's no, like, hijinks. we have we need to go get the seeds of my best plants and I want to get my chickens and I need to go and get all my stuff. And it's just so cute. Also, there's a, a thing where um, like, uh, oh, what is it? Finder keeps jumping into her boobs to hang out. And Dustwife is like, you want to stop doing that before he becomes like a rooster and has claws. And she's like, well, look, if a man isn't going to do it. Um, I just... She's like, a man hasn't wanted to dive head first into my bosom for a while, so... Again, this is where I thought we were going to make a joke with another word, but we don't. Um, I just always think I always like it when old ladies have a sex drive. <laughs> it's both funny, but also just like a nice thing to normalize. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other nice thing that Mara did is, she, or not Mara, that Kanya did for Mara is she told her servants that they needed to collect every scrap of the bones from the evil bone dog so that it could be taken to Our Lady of Grackles so that it could be uh, dispelled. Purified. The evil magic could be purified before it, the bones were destroyed. And that if they left any pieces, it would like haunt the, the castle. And she gives it to Mara so Mara can put back together a bone dog. And the book ends with like... Agnes and Dustwife have gone off to like be roommates. <laughs> and it's Fenris and Mara who are like, what, what are you going to do now? He's like, are you going to go back to your convent? And she's like, nah, I don't. Do you want to like not go home together? And he's like, I'd like that. And then she's like putting together Bone Dog and she's like, Bone Dog, please come back. And like, he's all there, but he's not coming back to life. And she's crying and her tear falls and it goes on Bone Dog. And then he's alive and happy. And there's a moment where her and Fenris are almost going to kiss. And Bone Dog's like, we're obviously wrestling and just <laughs> jumps on them. And that's the way the book ends. Very cute. And very, again, there's like a lighthearted fairy tale-ness to the second half of this book outside of like s some weird moments that are horrifying and like that's a perfect ending for it but like it's also not a perfect ending for the beginning um i think it would have been a better line if like they didn't know bone dog was i actually thought bone dog should have stayed dead like thematically speaking even though i liked him but i thought it would have been funnier if they didn't know he was going to resurrect and then when they go for the kiss that's how they figure out he resurrected if he thought yeah. they were wrestling like yeah. that would have like hit that a little bit better super cute um I, someone, I think Lindbergh had mentioned he kind of wished Fenris had died. died. And I, I do think with how dark the beginning was, thematically, that would have worked a bit more. But again, the the thing set up, the cannibal fairy tale set up at the start of this, not what happened. Yeah. So honestly, I think the fix would have been to just write not that like to not have not mention cannibals in an <laughs> evil land that is steadily creeping closer and closer to the northern kingdoms like if you would just cut it's that weird. out also i i gotta i gotta notice a few things um lindberg ships uh dust wife and agnes she says i got Fair a vibe enough. between agnes and the dust wife i don't think this is all just wishful thinking I, I ship them as like roommates but um and then a couple people thought that he should fenris should have died right um, and then said that Mara can resurrect him as Bone Man, um, which Angry Otter says, uh, okay, I'm going to go with Bone Wrist, which is pretty good. And Lindbergh went with Fen Bones. Fen Bones. Both very, very good names. And also Magical Girl Shauna in, in uh, comment to uh, the <laughs> Dust Wife and Agnes roommates. roommates. <laughs> I love the idea of two like witchy lesbians just having their little farm and like 
their chickens and just live in a cute little life. Those are your mothers. (laughs) You're literally just describing your mothers. (laughs) 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 Maria has lesbian moms for the record. I do have lesbian moms. They're super cute. Um, Um, Yeah, I love it. Um, Ms. Alisino says this book does feel like a patchwork of several different stories. Yeah, it's just it's a it's a weird mix. I think the author is really talented. Um, both of the stories work in their if they weren't put together. They would both work very well separately on their own. So I could see a book where she just picks one and keeps to it would work really let's well. Do, let's do because people are already doing it. Let's do a rewrite video where we and, and which isn't to say I liked this book. I think this author did a good job. I liked where it actually ended up. But the beginning is not followed through on. Let's do a rewrite. How would this book work if we oh. stuck with the cannibal zombie premise and oh, the God. dark You're lands? Right. We do need to do that. Let's do it. We ha- listen. Oh. We have we have rewritten just like bad books. In this case, it is just a missed potential. Yeah, it's and it's also just a premise that doesn't go anywhere. Let me check the schedule because if we could do that with the patrons, that would be cool. Oh, that would be so great. With our what was we what were we gonna call the tier? Oh, I forgot. I'll have to look it up. Wait. Yeah, yeah, you're going to. I think it was. Read through the comments to see. Uh, would the introduction of the cannibals feel better if she goes back to this universe and explores that? Yes. A- again, though, I would have liked it to come up at the end. Like, it's just a weird thing to have so prominently at the beginning and then just to not touch. It's it's the kind of things where if something you're going to explore in a sequel, it needs to come up in the middle of this book as a thing and then be a little bit more prominent and then you explore it. To come at the beginning, never get touched on again and then just, like, happen. Yeah. Like, also, okay, so next week we're doing Dark Lord of Durkholm, which none of you guys are reading, but it's okay, I understand. Um, uh, so we can't do it then, but maybe the 21st we could do it, and that wouldn't be too. I want to do it soon before we lose the wait, idea. I thought, yes, I agree. I thought we were gonna do Sarah J. Mass the 21st. Shh. Oh, you're not supposed to tell people. <laughs> we're doing that with Katie though, so we can't do it Sunday morning anyway. Yeah, we can't. Uh, Blistered Panda, the rewritening. Oh. Uh, that's a good that's a good point. I can already see the thumbnail. Fairy tale meets zombies or something like that. That could be good. I mean, nobody will really click on it because it's not one of like this is not a very well known book. Um, but it could be good for you, our lovely parasocial darlings. Um, but yeah, overall, I think this book is if if you're okay with the mismatch between those two, I actually think it's a it's a pretty solid book, honestly, even as it is now. I didn't unenjoy it i see my could see myself when i was younger really enjoying like because i kind of read books now that are like just reviewing books on a regular basis is a different what is it (laughs) omfg i heard i'm here for that this is my excited (laughs) face it's an m for the record um because that's her name that's how it shows up but um yeah i I, yeah I, i actually I I would suggest this book for people who like uh, storytell type retellings. A lot of people in the Discord were really kind of tired with it and don't love the options for next month um, because they're so also, fairy tale. Somebody mentioned that this was a retelling of a specific fairy tale. I know a lot of fairy tales and I'm not familiar with this one. So what is the fairy tale? I'd love to look it up and see what the differences were. If somebody will just throw that in the chat, but continue. Yeah, no, Um. because yeah, I, I don't know. Is it a specific? I don't know. Uh, it could be maybe like Bluebeard. Maybe, it is not know. Bluebeard. Well, Bluebeard is like the generic he's killing his wives kind of story. Um, yeah. So, I mean, again, I actually would suggest this if you like uh, storytelling retellings and you like either of the genres. I mean, especially if you're okay with more of a uh, jokey pedestrian. I don't I don't have a good word for it. There's a word for it and I can't think of it because I was sick last week and I'm still a little sick. Um, but yeah, I think those are overall our thoughts. Um, leave your thoughts in the comments if you're watching this later. Uh, stay tuned. We will try to do the rewrite video. I think that would be pretty cool. I think we uh, should. I love fairy tale horror. <laughs> like that's like my favorite thing. So that would I be I thought really that's cool. where this was going originally. I like where it ended up. It, for me, it, that's a soft spot for me. I love like the fairy tale retelling I knew you were gonna like it especially because you tend to like like funnier less dark things than me where I'm like suffering pain emotional pain it's uh it's it's a fundamental difference between the two of us we're like the light my room look look at can you tell him I'm like me and Agnes we bought yeah no you and I are like the white and black mage in a group or yeah I don't know (laughs) I'm like I'm like the hedge the little hedge witch and you're like the the like dark 
angsty night yeah because yeah. he's ruggedly handsome um yes. but yeah no that's all uh you guys have any last thoughts in the chat um uh, before we go we go uh valerie <laughs> says i'm glad my first book wreck in the club book club wasn't a flop um you know, honestly, even when they are a flop, uh, I think Poppy Wars was <laughs> somebody in the, I forget, one of our patrons was like, I'm sorry I picked this. It's okay. I pick books all the time, and Maria has been giving me a lot of shade lately for not picking good ones, and it's like, you just War. don't know. You just don't know, and it's, so I, I even used to um, vet the books by reading, like, the first chapter uh, before we did them, but you just can't tell, because the first chapter is always the most polished, and, like, this book would have, yes, Pumpkin is very cute. I mean, is, is a, a, she's such a pretty, pretty cat. She's like a tiger mixed with a rug. But look how round she looks. She's just a face on like a little round circle of yeah. fluff. She's very cute. Um, uh, Chelsea, Chelsea says, this is a great book for someone who likes fairy tale retellings and enjoys books with a frivolous vibe that doesn't have a lot of self-reflection. I think so. Yes. And especially I think younger YA too would have fun with this. Um, someday one of my Rex will make it cries. Hey, you know, it's uh, some people get a lot. Shelby always picks up like Shelby's had like four, I think. It's really just, you know, we pick them, but you never quite know what's going to win and what isn't. Um, if you are uh, patrons, by the way, the uh, nominations will close tonight for polls. So go vote if you want one. Uh, we don't blame anyone for book flubs. Flip book flops book flops yeah it just happens um and book flops make for great discussions uh this is why i will often read a book summary before i read the actual book i try and it just doesn't it doesn't really work i don't um, i like going in blind i didn't read the summary for this one either yeah that's her privilege because she's not having to actually pick the books i have to go like i'm trying to get us to do more books on for that are releasing that month so that yeah. we can get some traction in the algorithm i i've decided i'm breaking the books into to, to, to four categories uh the patreon book at the end of the month which we don't get to pick uh one that's coming out that month so that we can stay relevant in the algorithm uh trying to do one bad one every other month and then do more rereads because um I really, there's some books we got that I really liked as a kid. You know, we have 15 viewers. That's more than we normally That's do at insane. this point. Celia said, can you mention the SJM in the Discord, or do you guys want to keep it a secret? Uh, you guys can mention it. It's fine. I was mostly just like, I, I have this thing where I really like to surprise people by just dropping something really big, like for gifts or stuff. If I send Maria something, I don't even tell her. I'll just, so just open the package and it's there and it's nice. Um, well, non-patrons will be surprised. I mean, it's fine. It really is. It's totally fine. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. If you uh, like this, go join our Patreon. Lots of cool, sexy people and discussions. Uh, Great. Bye. When I tell you top tier class of people, amazing. All right. You go ahead and do the outro. Thanks for joining us, guys. See you next time. Bye.